you all so much for being here today. We're super excited to chat and answer some of the questions that we had prepared, some of the questions that we got from, from some of you. And I actually also added some of the questions that we got from the webinar we did earlier this week about hospital births, because I thought some of them were really relevant to birthing centers too. Yeah. Um, so thank you for being here. We're going to have a time for Q&A at the end. If you have any questions, you can drop them in the chat along the way. You can drop them in the Q&A. And if it's something to clarify what we're saying, I might stop us in the middle, but otherwise we'll, we'll just have time to answer those questions. Um, we also, I dropped a link in the chat, Ladybird PT, which is a physical therapy clinic in Austin that I own that focuses on pregnancy and postpartum is doing a birth prep discount for the rest of the month of July. So there's a code in there if you are interested in birth prep education and how it affects your pelvic floor, how to prepare your pelvic floor for birth, please feel free to reach out to me via that link and we can, we can chat to see if there's anything that we can do to help you. Um, as a disclaimer, I feel like disclaimers are important. We are not claiming that a birthing center birth is the best or only option for everybody. However, birthing center births are what we're here to talk about today. Um, this webinar is going to be recorded and as will any questions that you enter. We can't see your names in the recording, but if you aren't comfortable with us saying your name when we read out your question, you are free to exit and then watch the recording later. But that's just something that I like to make sure everybody knows. Um, and that's kind of it for disclaimers. Michelle, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, yes. So I'm uh, Michelle Gold. Um, I am a midwife at Austin Area Birthing Center, and I've been in the birth world since 2010, so I'm coming up on 10 years. Um, I started off as a doula, and I was an independent doula for a while, and then joined a practice called Get Baby, now ATX doulas. A lot of them went to, to do that one, so shout out to them. And then I got hired on here in 2011, so I'm coming up on my nine-year anniversary, uh, and I was hired here as a birth assistant. And so what birth assistants do here at the birth center is we come in towards the end of the labor and they assist the midwives with the delivery. And then we do a lot of hands-on postpartum and then like cleaning and restocking and all the other vital stuff that is needed at the birth center as a part of the team. So I did that for a long time before I decided that midwifery was the way I wanted to go. Um, I also taught the breastfeeding class for many years. I did the centering group prenatal care as a co-facilitator. Um, and then I started my apprenticeship. I was here at the birth center for all my apprenticeship for three years, did some home births, and then became a staff midwife. And I've been officially a staff midwife for a year now here at the birth center. That's oh, and I had both of my daughters at the birth center too. That's so <laughs> yeah. cool. Yeah. How old are your daughters? I had my, they are, um, oh, they just had birthdays, 11 and eight. And um, my oldest was born at the North Center in the what's now called Aspen Room. And then my youngest was born here at the South Center um, in the Volk Life Room. That's really amazing. I didn't know that you were a doula before. Yeah, yeah. That's I kind of I wanted to like dip my toe in the birth world to see if I had the had what it takes. Before diving head first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, thank you for introducing yourself. My name is Rebecca. I am a pelvic floor physical therapist. And like I said earlier, the owner of Lady Bird PT, we focus exclusively on pregnancy and postpartum. So managing pregnancy pains, preparing for childbirth, postpartum recovery. Um, we've been doing this. I've been doing this under Lady Bird for the past year and a half. And I've been doing this since I graduated from PT school in 2017. So I'm super excited to be here and to learn more from Michelle about birthing centers and ask all the questions that I've had, but also ask the questions that you've all had. Um, and I'm just really excited to be here. If you weren't on the call earlier, you would have learned that I hate Austin Summers. <laughs> and that I understand why everybody in Texas keeps telling people that are not from here to get out. Um, but I really love being in Austin. I really am like so in love with the birthing community in this city and so grateful for all of the amazing collaboration and support yeah. and just like how easy it was to set up this webinar with you. Yeah. I'm so grateful for that. So I'm, I'm really excited to get started. Great. Mm -hmm. So the first question, if you're ready to dive in, mm -hmm. is, and this I actually just added when you were talking, but I, I know you're not going to have a problem answering it. Can you talk to us a little bit about the difference between midwifery care and traditional OBGYN care? Yeah, that's a, a really uh, good question. So um, the you know, traditional kind of like medical model of care is typically what the OB-GYNs are centered in. And so it's a little bit more of, you know, looking, 
you know, at the systems and making sure that they're all functioning, but making sure that if there is something not functioning, fixing that, where I think that midwifery is more of a holistic um, and it's more of a, of a parent centered care. And so we look at the whole body, not just the, not just the mom and fetus and like what the systems involved in that. Um, we tend to um, spend more, we'll spend more time with our patients um, and we only deal with low risk clients. That's the, probably the biggest difference is that OBs and, and um, gynecologists can deal with the high risk patients. And I'm so grateful for the wonderful OBs that we have here in town um, that can handle those mom, uh, those pregnant people that need a little bit more, um, need a little more guidance, need a little bit more help. Um, but we deal with mainly low risk, um, low risk pregnant people. Um, and we tend to believe that the parents are the direct care providers for their little ones. They tend to know their bodies best, to know their babies best, and we really encourage um, and empower them to speak up for themselves and to, um, in helping their family unit grow. That's amazing. And I think what, one thing that I really love about the Austin community is that there seems to be, and there seems to be such a respect between all of the providers, between OBs and midwives and mm -hmm. doulas and PTs. And I really, I love how well everybody seems to work together. Yes. Uh, I've really heard, yeah. I've, I've heard that it's not that way everywhere. And so I'm, I'm grateful. Yeah. You touched on this a little bit, but could you define low risk versus high risk? Because I hear really frequently that being over a certain age does put you into a high risk category, doesn't put you into a high risk category. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about that stratification? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit tricky because there, there can be a lot of kind of gray area. Um, but typically when we see a pregnant person, we're looking at their, you know, the medical history and making sure that nothing precludes them from becoming, um, coming into our care. And so that could be, you know, big things are going to uh, preclude those people right away. So like history, like seizure disorders, already having hypertension disorders, um, diabetes, all of, um, all any pregnant person with those complications will need to be managed what, by an OB. They're going to need to have more specialized care. Um, so we're looking at that. And then I always like to say that midwives, as midwives, we're the guardians of normal. And so as we're going through pregnancy, we're looking at the mom and baby and making sure that they're remaining healthy, but we're doing a risk assessment almost every time that we see them and saying, do they remain in this low risk category? And so, you know, we've had plenty of um, pregnant people who come to us that are, you know, what's called AMA, the advanced maternity age that are 35, 38, 40, 45, um, it might be their first, it might be their fifth pregnancy. Um, but we just look at their overall health status and really personalize their care as to what what they need um and so yeah it's a little bit of kind of gray when you look at you know like age specifically or right. or you know, some being overweight um it really depends on if there's other myriad of risk factors involved of that as well and if we do start to see something crop up then again as you said we have some fabulous ob's in town that we can consult with that we can refer to that they can meet with but and then ultimately if we're outside of that realm of normal that is when we need to um, put them with someone who can take care of them. Sure. In a specialized way. Mm -hmm. That's that's really helpful to hear that it's gray because I get a lot of questions from my patients who are like, you know, trying to conceive, who are 35, 36, mm -hmm. and they are wondering if a birthing center is an option. They're perfectly healthy, but they've heard that being over a certain age would put them into that high risk category automatically. So that's that's helpful to know that there is kind of a balance. Um, and just as a follow-up to what you were saying, so if somebody is coming to see you all in the birthing center and they develop gestational diabetes, they develop preeclampsia, are they automatically referred out? So it depends on the condition. So you mentioned gestational diabetes and that doesn't automatically put them out, um, out of our care. So what usually happens with our birth center is we have them co-managed with a maternal fetal medicine specialist. So what that means is they meet with the MFM, they have a consult with them, um, they learn a little bit about nutrition, they learn how to use the glucometer where they're gonna ch check their blood sugars at home. Mm -hmm. And then they have, typically they have like monthly growth scans as they go throughout their pregnancy. Okay. Um, if they need medication to, um, to um, help stabilize their blood sugars, then that is when they are, are at a higher risk and that is when they typically have to be in OB care for okay. that. Now, anything with hypertension is, that's very much set, um, set in stone and that is when they need to go to an OB. If we're dealing with gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, health, you know, any of that, then they need to go see an OB for that. That's mm -hmm. helpful, thank you. Yeah, and there's, um, there's a great website. You can actually read 
for from the state of Texas what um, licensed midwives, which is um, cert or certified professional midwives can or can't do in the state of Texas. Okay. And so if you just Google, I should have brought it up um, so we could like share screen, but um, if you just Google Texas midwifery rules, it will come up as a .gov. Um, midwifery rules. Mm -hmm. um, Texas midwifery rules. And you can see kind of what per the, per the state we can't do so like hypertension is on there diabetes before pregnancy is on there um, but then you can also see the stuff that's like well if this develops maybe recommend transfer or consult with an ob um, but it doesn't mean like a hard fast transfer out of care okay that's so that, that could be a good place for people to go now if you're at a birth center where there's all certified nurse midwives their scope of practice is a little bit different so i don't know if we need to talk about the difference in the midwives? Do we have practices in Austin that are entirely certified nurse midwives? I believe at Natural Beginnings with Dr. Salt. They're all CNMs. All CNMs. Mm -hmm. um, we could, yeah, we could talk about the difference if you want to. Yeah, so certified nurse midwives, you know, um, they typically have their, you know, bachelor's in nursing and then their master's in nursing with a, a focus in midwifery. Um, most of their most of their training will be hospital based um, and clinic based that way. Um, but there's some, I mean, we have the, we have CNMs here at the center, and they're just really fabulous um, midwives. And then we have certified professional midwives, um, also called licensed midwives. So depending on what certification they get. So if they're licensed midwives here in Texas, that means that, that we have our license through the state of Texas. And so we are able to practice with just that license. There's a more nationally recognized one that is done through the um, North American Registration of Midwives. And I might've gotten that name wrong, but we just call it NARM. Um, but that's the uh, certified professional midwife. Um, okay. And that's where we, we take that, um, the, our exam, our boards through NARM, and then we can become licensed through the state as well as with CPM. So like mine is Michelle Gold, LM, CPM, or I could just be LM um, in the state of Texas if I wanted to. Okay, okay, that, so, that makes sense. Yeah, and the background for CPMs and LMs is typically, there's like an online educational component that many people take, although they don't have to take it, but many people do. And then there's an apprenticeship. And typically the apprenticeship is anywhere from three to five years in length. Okay. So I, did, I did three years of uh, as an apprentice um, here at the birth center. That's it's just so, so many steps and also so many different paths to get to this place. That's really yeah. cool. And I think that's where like a lot of confusion comes from the medical world as far yeah. as like CPMs because it, it can vary from state to state. And so the, and the background for CPMs and LMs can vary from state to state. Um, and so I think it's, it can be confusing for some OBs in other parts of the country where they're not as lucky as we are as here in Austin to have these relationships. So they're like, wait a minute, I don't know what it means for you to be a CPM. What kind of background right. do you have? Whereas a CNM has like, we know exactly the steps, the educational stuff that they went through. But you right. get fabulous midwives from both paths. I think that there's so much mistrust in the medical community that comes from this lack of awareness of what we do, which is why I think in an environment like this where people are communicative, where they do have relationships and collaboration that leads to so much better patient care. Because oh, if, yes. you're, if you're not scared to refer out to somebody who might be a better fit for that individual person, right. then you're then everybody is going to be able to get the kind of care that they really need. So I think that that's really beautiful and also really important. So that's, that's great. Thank you for explaining that. Of course. Um, I hope I did it justice. <laughs> no, you definitely did. It was super, super clear, really helpful. And that's, I had kind of ideas about each of those things, but yeah. I didn't know what, why LM was there. So that's yeah. super helpful. Yeah. Good, good. Um, so here's another question. What kind of questions do you suggest that patients and clients ask their potential midwives to determine whether they're the right provider for them? Yeah. So when, um, when I read this question on your list, I was like, oh boy. This could be a lot, like we could spend the whole hour, I think, <laughs> talking about what to ask your midwife. Um, Cause there's like a lots of different components that you can be right. asking about. You can ask about, you know, I would definitely ask about their practice, right? They're like, do they have, who's their backup? Um, do they work closely with another midwife? Is it just that midwife? Um, you know, cause there's some home births that might be just that midwife and then like an assistant. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just talking about birth center um, midwives, I should probably say. So how long have you been practicing? Um, who's your backup? What do you do if there's more than one person in labor at the birth center? Some birth centers do a combination of birth center and home birth. So that's probably something you want to, want to um, talk about too. Like, okay, well, 
I'm at the birth center. Do I come into the birth center or do I have the choice of having a home birth? Mm -hmm. um, and then I would ask how many um, clients they take a month. Like what's their, what's their um, level? Because you want to make sure that they're not taking too many to overload the, the midwife and the staff. Um, and then going back to like kind of the OBs and the relationship with hospitals, I would ask your midwife about that because I think that does make a big difference. And if they are having like a birth center care and then a home birth, what is their relationship with the hospitals around the home? Mm -hmm. um, and do they have a good relationship? Have they ever transported to that hospital? Um, so that, that could be a question that you ask, that people ask too, to the midwife. I always like to... Um, ask um, what the midwife's thoughts on, on doulas are, because I think, I believe that doulas are just an integral part of the birth team, especially for first time parents. I hype them up so much. Um, and so I, and I do, I have heard of some midwives who don't really like doulas. They want to be like the, the ones there. And so I, you know, if you're thinking about getting a doula, that's definitely something you want to ask your provider, you know, whoever it is. Um, and then you can ask them more kind of like specific questions to kind of get to know their personality. You can ask them their, their philosophy on labor and birth, what, their, what, you, what they feel like their role is as a midwife. Um, you can ask them about social justice matters too and, uh, and see if they are online with you as well. You, you, know, you definitely wanna make sure that when you pick your provider, that you're gonna be a good team and that you have trust there. And so um, you might wanna you know, think about things that um, would make you comfortable or make you uncomfortable in a situation that can be very vulnerable, right? Labor and birth can be very, can be pretty vulnerable. Um, I mean, there's, like I said, there's lots of questions. You can ask about the midwife if she um, has um, prescriptive, like if she can call in prescriptions, some midwives can, and you can ask about what medications that they have um, at their birth center too. Um, it just really depends on if they have like a collaborating physician that um, gives them prescriptive authority or not. Okay. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, those questions were amazing. And a lot of those <laughs> I never would have thought of. I think that, I think for a lot of people, there's this concern of like, what happens if I transfer? But I think if you've had that conversation with your midwife and you know what transferring to the hospital would look like and what the relationship is there, that's so beneficial and so kind of like, comforting right um, and I, I think that a lot of those questions are just like really excellent points including the social, the social justice question because I know that I mean a, a lot of us are starting to talk about it now that birth work is political and it's yeah. difficult to it's difficult to feel like with something so vulnerable in your life and such an intimate life experience that you have to shield your beliefs and your opinions from the person who's taking care of you because it is such a personal relationship right um, so I think that that's a really amazing Point. And I also, this question of doulas came up when I was speaking with Dr. Skarziga earlier this week. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about how not all providers are going to be open to doulas. And my personal opinion on that is that that's kind of a red flag, right? Because yes. we, we know how positive the impact of doulas are mm -hmm. on childbirth outcomes and childbirth experiences. Mm -hmm. And so I always feel like if there is a provider who's strongly opposed to doula care as a whole to me that's very that's concerning right and i don't i mean the the stories that i've heard hasn't been that the midwives have been opposed to doulas that just they're just like well it's just not necessary i'll be there. okay and i and i get that there are some midwives who have such a boutique practice and you know right. give such attention to their clients that they post maybe, maybe they don't need that they'll be the ones to provide sure. their support but for a birth center the numbers are probably going to be you know we're going to have a little bit more clients than probably a very small birth center or a home birth um and so again i just love doulas because even in the in a hospital transport they they help out a lot too like yeah to the hospital um and um i think it kind of ties in with their philosophy of being a midwife too um my personal philosophy is that we are that we are guides and that we empower families, but it's not that we're giving them power, we're just helping recognize the power that they have. It sounds really cheesy, the power they have within them all along. But there there are providers, whether OBs, midwives, you know, in any scope and any part of medical care that you are a part of, you're gonna have providers who who view themselves as the saviors. And right. in life, I do not believe that. So you might be able to kind of suss out who has thinking along those thoughts. Um, 
by asking those kind of questions. And that's um, true in the pelvic floor PT world too, where people think this is the only option, the only way that you can fix this problem, the only, the only possible path. And right. I think that's where you start to see in the rehab world, this like chiropractic PT battle that I think mm -hmm. is hopefully passing and not as common anymore. But I agree, I think that finding a provider who doesn't feel like they are your answer, but rather they're, they're guiding you to what you already know you need. Yeah, yeah, and tailored to each person as well. Um, I will say that a lot of those questions um, I got the ideas for from other websites. <laughs> so uh, one of them was Mama, uh, Mama Natural. Um, I think that is actually her name, yeah. Um, so she has like an online childbirth education class too, but she had like a whole list of questions. So you, you, you just, <laughs> yeah, if you just Google like questions asked at a birth center, you can kind of piece together um, you know, what you need. But a lot of people, I will say, when they come in to ask questions, like during the tours and stuff, it mostly involves like transports, like the what if scenarios. Like, yeah. You know, how fast can you get to the hospital? You know, what does that look like going to the hospital? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So that we don't spend our whole session on one question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause we could. Yeah, I know. We could, we could always do a second 2.0. Um, this question is related, I think, to what you were just talking about, but why may someone choose a birthing center over a hospital or a home birth? This is a, it's a really good question. And the, the things that I hear the most from people who do come into our care um, is they, they just weren't, they'll, they'll, they'll literally say, I just didn't feel ready to give birth at home. So maybe it's their first kiddo. Um, and so they don't, since they don't know what pregnancy looks like. They don't know what birth can look like, you know, for them. Um, I think they just feel comfortable not being in their home for that. They might also not really know what's involved with home birth and how, mm -hmm. and how amazing the midwives are at like sneaky cleaning where you like turn around and you're like, oh, everything's done and cleaned up. And so they, they don't have the concept of like, well, who's going to do all of that? Like there's a tub, right. there's a new baby, like there's probably going to be a mess everywhere. Um, so I think they just have trouble kind of wrapping their idea, like their head around that idea of what, what works. And so I think it gives them a little better peace of mind coming to like a dedicated birthing space and then going home as a family unit. Um, another reason it, it's kind of a compromise sometimes between the mom, between the, the laboring person and their, or the pregnant person and their partner. Um, so the pregnant person might be like, I want to give birth at home or I want to give birth out of hospital and the partner is not ready for that or vice versa. I've had it where the partner like really wants to have a home birth, but the pregnant person is like, I'm not really ready for that. And so sometimes the birth center is a compromise. Um, again, we have to work really hard on getting the trust established there for all parties because uh, I have seen that play out in a very interesting dynamic in the birth room. Sure. Between the two, especially with the partner really wanting to be here, but the pregnant person not really wanting to be here. And typically, they don't usually stay here. They usually end up at the hospital at some point in like a non-emergency situation. Um, right. So those situations are a little bit more tricky because we want to make sure, like I said, we have all the trust aboard. And so that usually means the partner coming to visits or being a part of childbirth education. Um, that's usually when I really recommend a doula <laughs> as well. Um, so everybody gets really excited and motivated to give birth out of hospital. That's great. That That's really helpful and makes a lot of sense. I wouldn't have thought of it as being a compromise, but even when I've discussed this with my partner, like where would we want to birth? It, mm -hmm. Birthing centers do kind of come up as like this happy medium. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, make, it makes sense. Yeah. And then, you know, some people, we, I'm sorry to interrupt, but some people come in from far away. And so maybe staying here and laboring here puts them already closer to a good hospital. As opposed okay. to, there's a lot of rural hospitals shutting down, especially right. the LND wards. Like I think uh, Baylor Scott and White and Marble Falls LND just shut down. So we might yeah. have in because of that because they're like well I can you know attempt to give birth here but I'm also close to a hospital with a good NICU if I'm already in town yeah it's a safe space mm -hmm. yeah um that that also makes a lot of sense we so our next question we already kind of touched on this with our high risk low risk uh question but who mm -hmm. may not be appropriate for a birthing center and I guess we could also approach this question from maybe a, a broader perspective like what what kind of mentality might make somebody not appropriate for a birthing center or yeah, that's a really, that's a really good question. Um, because there are, yeah, that I can see that coming up. So we talked about the risk assessment for the physical, the physical components. Um, 
So, um, you know, we talked about, you know, GDM, that gestational diabetes, that um, where the blood sugars can't be controlled with just diet and exercise. Um, you know, if any time you have like preterm premature rupture of membranes, preterm labor, which per Texas state law is defined under 37 weeks, um, then that would be someone needing to go to the hospital or to the um, OB, um, depending on the situation. Um, you know, there's, um, Licensed midwives in the state of Texas can do multiples if it's twins, triplets or higher, cannot be done um, out of hospital uh, with a LM. Um, our um, C-sections with a vertical incision. Those are all like kind of hard and fast rules where you have to be with an OB. Mm -hmm. um, your question on like, like if it's a good fit, like, um, like emotionally, mentally, I think it goes back to what I was just talking about as far as like everybody being on board and making sure that this is what we really want to do. And actually there's a kind of a more relevant example of this, um, people who are exploring out of hospital births because of COVID-19. I don't feel like fear of COVID-19 is enough to get you through like if that's your only motivation to give birth out of hospital, I don't feel like that's enough. Like I feel like your motivation needs to be like, I really believe in my body. I trust my body. I trust my baby. I'm going to you know, do this at home or do this at the birth center unmedicated. Um, but if you were going through and just COVID-19 scared you away from the hospital, then you might, I mean, you might just have just a lovely fine birth, but I feel like um, that's not enough of a motivation. So that might not be the best fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Does that make sense? Does that yeah, absolutely. Make sense? And that yeah. specifically actually came up also at, in the webinar with Dr. Escarzaga as well, because we were talking about birthing centers and, and home births and hospital births. And, you know, we approached that conversation from the same perspective. Hospital births aren't for everybody. But her, her perspective on that was that COVID-19 should not be your only reason for being scared to go to the hospital. And if you are concerned, having a conversation with your OB might really help to reduce that fear because there are a lot of precautions in place. Labor and delivery units are pretty mm -hmm. separate. They are very careful. They're very, um, very cautious. And so I think that talking to her about that gave me a very different perspective into what birthing in a hospital would be like right now mm -hmm. versus what I imagined it to be with COVID. Yeah. Right. So I think that that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I also, I think choosing, choosing one option out of fear is also probably a difficult place to start from. Yeah. And there are people even before COVID-19 that come to us because they absolutely do not want to go to a hospital. And I get that, you know, um, hospital, whether they had like a bad situation or they witnessed a relative having a bad situation at a hospital and hospitals are primarily for sick people. Right. And so I, I get that perspective, but if that's your only motivation, then sometimes, sometimes those, um, laboring people need to work harder to, to get through because, you, I mean, like I said, the motivation to give birth out of hospital, unmedicated, I mean, it's got to come like from a place within that you sometimes don't even, can't even verbalize. But if it's just like, oh, I hate hospitals, that's why I'm here. I usually have a conversation with that family about, okay, well, I view hospitals as a tool, right? Because um, labor is a very kind of intricate dance between a bunch of different components that we can't control all of them. And so if we need more tools, I view those as tools that we can use. And I feel like, I think one, like we talked about earlier, being in Austin, we have great relationships with the area hospitals, but two, being able to go to a hospital and not have to walk for two days to get to the hospital or have a hospital that's relatively protected and clean. We're very you know, lucky um, to have that, very um, privileged to have that. And so if we need to go for those tools and we're using them correctly, you know, then um, I think hospitals are totally appropriate places to to give birth. I don't, I don't view it as like a failure of someone's labor or failure of someone's um, capacity to give birth out of hospital. I think that that's a really important statement and point as well, not to look at a transfer as a failure, because I think so many people do. And in the, yeah. in the birth plan, transferring would be like, I failed here, I need to right. go here. And so I right. think that looking at it as kind of like, one team and each teammate having a different role is yeah. much more, I don't know, just take some of the shame and negativity away from it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. So 
Very timely. Our next question is, why would you have to transfer from a birthing center and what happens if you do? <laughs> Sounds yeah, like a lot of experience <laughs> answering this. Nice segue there. Um, <laughs> So if it's, you know, if it like, like we're talking about the conditions that come up in pregnancy, um, you know, depending on the situation, it's typically not an emergency. It's typical that we have like a, cons a consult with, um, with an OB and then that person that goes and sees the OB or they're transferred to the OB, depending on what's going on. Um, and then, but usually when I get that question, it's about labor. Um, so, you know, what happens in that moment? Cause there's, you know, there can be moments where you don't have nice long conversations about what's going on and what we, what we offer and what we can do. So, um, in an emergency situation, we typically, um, call 911 and at our birth center, we do have, um, things that we can do to help while we're waiting 911 and to help stabilize, um, the pregnant, the laboring person and baby if we need to. So um, like situations would be like if we are hearing um, heart tones that we don't like to hear during labor and birth isn't imminent, then we actually um, have a medication that can stop contractions while we're going to a hospital. Like let's say we're hearing the contractions, uh, or the, sorry, the heart tones dip with the contractions. Well, mm -hmm. well, the hospital, let's stop that stress point for baby and give to the hospital and then put baby on a continual fetal monitoring system because that changes your risk status too. We only do intermittent monitoring here with a Doppler, with like one of those handheld um, Dopplers. Um, and we do it every 30 minutes in active labor unless we need to do it more and we do every five to 10. But if the baby needs to be monitored more, um, then that would be like, we need to go lights and siren, probably to the closest hospital for our South location, which is where we're at right now. Um, that would be South Austin Medical Center for our North location, which is up off Duval near the domain. That would be North Austin Medical Center. Okay. Um, and typically we are either calling on the way and giving report to the charge nurse or straight to the OB hospitalist group, um, whoever's on call. Um, and we're doing you know, everything we can on the way to help. Um, and the same is true for after the birth, if there's bleeding that we either can't control or we've got it controlled, but it was just too much and that um, that parent needs to be monitored, then we would go EMS to the closest hospital too, or if the placenta doesn't come in a timely manner. And everybody has different kind of protocols on that. We have our own protocols here that we are um, abiding by. Um, but again, it's kind of like one of those things where like, this is what we, we're seeing, this is what we recommend, and we need to go now. Um, and that can be a pretty, pretty, you know, not fun, scary situation for everybody involved because, you know, we're very sweet most of the time. Um, but when it comes down to like an emergency, I tend to get a little bit drill sergeant and tend to right. start kind of barking orders uh, to like my assistants and stuff like that. They're, they're wonderful. They're, they put up with me a lot. Um, most of our transports, though, in labor, I will say are probably non-emergent transports. And so what that typically looks like is maybe we've had um, where the laboring person has had a couple of nights of contractions that are just aren't getting like to that point of active labor, but it's keeping them up. Maybe it's keeping them from eating. Maybe they're vomiting. So they're getting depleted all around emotionally, mentally, and physically. And as we know, the uterus is a muscle. And so after a while, that muscle is just not going to be very efficient. And so let's say we're here at the center. And we're trying to either get the laboring person some rest um, or we're trying to get things to get the labor going more so we can get into active labor, um, which could be like, you know, different positions. Um, we can do rest. We do have IV fluids that we can administer here at the center as well. So if that person is getting depleted um, on hydration, on, if they're getting dehydrated, then we can help try to fix that. But it's typically for the non-emergent transports, it's typically not a surprise. Um, it's usually an ongoing conversation. Okay. So, and if, if, the, if the laboring person is doing well and the baby sounds good and we're making just a little bit of progress, whatever that looks like, it's not just about dilation, but maybe baby's coming down more, maybe the cervix is softening more, maybe we're now getting strong contractions, so let's see what happens after an hour or two of that. Um, so, you know, we have a conversation where we're like, this is what we're seeing, this is what we recommend, how are you doing? Do you still want to go forth, you know, here? And if they're like, yes, then we're like, okay, great. We're still monitoring. We're checking vitals um, frequently, mom's blood pressure, pulse, you know, checking on baby. Um, but there tends to be a point where the mom, where the, I'm sorry, the, the labor person really declares that they're ready to go. And uh, most of the time I'm actually having to stop them from running out the door 
to go to the hospital to get their epidural. I'm like, wait, I got to like update your chart and like right. call, the, <laughs> call down to see like, who's my favorite OB tonight? Like, is it South Austin or is it at St. David's Maine or is it even at North Austin Medical Center? Um, so I might, you know, try to try to shop around a little bit. And that's then, cool. That's not something that I ever would have thought of. Yeah. So we have, you know, we have kind of our favorites that we, that we, are <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I try to, and especially at that point, because the other thing I'm thinking about in all this process of like, let's try this and this and this to get either labor going or get baby or your cervix to dilate more is I'm thinking, okay, if we do have to transport, I want to get there in time to still have a vaginal birth. I don't want to like roll into the hospital when like the baby's telling us that they're done with labor or the mom is just so conked out at that point. I want to get there in time to have a vaginal birth. Like if the, if the plan shifts to hospital, I still want it to be vaginal if possible. Sure. So that's the other thing kind of I'm considering. And so I might be calling around because of that. But like I said, usually it's the, uh, it's the laboring person who declares like, okay, I'm ready. It's time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it makes sense that you would want to, they would want to transfer while there is still hope before they're so depleted that they mm -hmm. won't necessarily have as, as much, right. um, as much success. That, that makes complete sense. That's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, one more question, one that I think everybody's really interested in these days is what can you expect will be different during COVID-19 when birthing in a birthing center? So when I got this list of questions, I actually went through and made bullet points and I didn't for this one, <laughs> for this question, <laughs> because it, it's changing so much. I was like, <laughs> oh, no, I don't even know what to say most of the time. So uh, yeah, so we... Not a lot, but enough has changed, I feel like. And I, maybe that's true for everything dealing with COVID. Um, we are requiring masks in the building um, for everybody. Partners are allowed with um, clients now if they want to come in for prenatal visits. But for a while, we were just saying just client, just client solo. No kids are allowed in the building, which is kind of sad. One of my favorite things is when siblings would come and I'd have them like hold the Doppler, you know, um, on the belly. And so that's a little sad, but um, you know, they just, kids are so cute, but they just put their hands on everything. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what, social distancing. Yeah, and we, yeah, exactly. It's hard for them. Um, and we screen everybody when they come in. We don't have availability for testing at our center at this time. So we don't do testing like upon admission or somebody, you know, if they have a fever, they don't come to the center at all. We send them somewhere else to, to get tested. Um, and then as far as like, if a pregnant person contracts COVID-19 and has symptoms or is tested positive, it really just depends where in their pregnancy that happens. We're doing a lot of visits via telehealth, so we can, we can do that via telehealth. Um, but when it comes to like, if they are COVID-19 and they're going into labor, then we don't have the equipment or the rooms here set up with like the negative pressure systems right. um, to, to handle that. So they would have to go to the hospital for delivery. We haven't had that happen yet. Um, but you know, like I said, things are, things are changing. Sure. Um, and we are still allowing a um, partner and one support person, ideally a doula, but the support person can be a family member as long as they're between the ages of 18 and 60, just because of the risk changes for. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and are birthing people wearing a mask during labor? Not typically. Sometimes if they come in and it's still early, they might wear it just because they walk in with it and they forget to take it off. But at some point they do take it off. Okay. Um, we're, we're all masked up and, um, you know, sometimes some of us wear goggles. So, so I wear like a surgical cap and I remember mm -hmm. it. Um, yeah, but we're just all, and we're all, you know, trying to take precautions as well. Sure. Sure. That is, that's very helpful. I think that um, that's a question that I get a lot. What's changed with COVID-19 in various settings. And I think that your it changes every day. So it's so such a hard question to answer, but also really helpful to kind of know at least the baseline and where everybody's starting from. So that's, that's really helpful. Good. Um, so on to a couple questions that we got from people who registered. Mm -hmm. What should people know about eating before, during, and after birth? That's a great question. I love it. Um, so, you know, having good, nutritious, wholesome meals all through your pregnancy, as you know, is going to help help that pregnant person feel good. And it's also going to help 
like their tissues and muscles and everything operate really efficiently. So I just recommend, you know, good healthy food, limiting sweet treats um, to one to two times a week. And then especially as we're getting towards like the due date or towards like she's starting to, uh, the labor person is starting to kind of like warm up a little bit, then I do, you know, recommend eating as usual and eating as desired. And we do allow eating um, and drinking as desired in labor and in the rooms. Um, typically what we find is kind of snacky food is really good for the laboring person. So like fruit that's easily digestible. Um, you know, sometimes some people will bring like shakes or juices, um, broth. We've had some people do like bone broth. Um, I really like the labor aid drinks. Do you know about those drinks? Oh. You, make your, you make your own electrolyte drink. And there's so many different recipes out there. If you just Google labor aid, you'll see a bunch of different variations. I'll have to look at I feel like in Texas, we should all have some kind of electrolyte drink. Like you have your water in the fridge, you have your milk, and then there's your electrolyte drink. Because yeah, we just need labor aid every day for life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so you can have like coconut water as a base or red raspberry leaf tea, oh. like, um, sea salt, just Celtic sea salt that you put in there, lemon juice, honey, and you can kind of play around with it um, in pregnancy. So you know what is it is to your taste. So in, in labor, the laboring person can drink that throughout labor because it's just so important to stay hydrated during before and during labor right that's that's really good to know did you say afterwards too for food or yeah so i guess i was thinking specifically right i imagine that they're thinking specifically after birth okay. if they're still in the hospital or hospital or birthing center for that matter yeah and so our stay here postpartum is six eight hours so okay. we have some families that leave at four if everything's if everyone's stable i have some we have some like repeat clients that like as soon as the baby's out they're like when can when can we go <laughs> so we're like just wait a minute and we want you to eat so that's a really important part of the postpartum stay we always recommend something hearty like lasagna um i personally had a i think it was a shepherd's pie after the oh God, yum. and a glass of champagne because it was my last so i was celebrating that so you can bring some champagne and share with your midwives if you want <laughs> um, that's that's totally fine um, so yeah, we definitely recommend something, you know, something hearty, something nutritious. Um, and we definitely want you to eat a little bit of something before getting up to go to the bathroom for the first time, before taking any ibuprofen, anything like that. Okay, that's helpful to know. Um, oh, this is a postpartum recovery question. So how long and how much should you be bleeding after birth? That's a great question. And it can vary actually for a lot of people. Um, so that first like two to three days can be the heaviest, but it starts to taper off typically about day two, day three, but it typically is like a very heavy flow in those first days. You might throw some little clots here and there, the little stringy ones are fine. What we don't want in that first, you know, day or two after birth is you to be filling a pad in an hour or less, having big clots plus a lot of bleeding plus feeling dizzy and woozy when that happens. Um, so you definitely want to call your care provider if that's happening. But, um, some people will have off and on bleeding up to six weeks. Some people will bleed, you know, like a light period for two weeks and then stop and then start again. Um, some people will just have light bleeding that goes to spotting that just eventually tapers off, usually by six. Sometimes you can, it can go up to eight weeks mm -hmm. uh, for some people. Um, I usually find that some people will have like a resurgence of bleeding around six weeks and I'm not sure of the exact science behind it, but what I like to imagine is that the, where the uterus was implanted is having its like final healing surge. And so we get a little bit of uh, bleeding because of that, um, but typically around six to eight weeks. Is. And, at, at, and this is more so for me for a follow-up question. At what point, because I see people at two, three weeks postpartum and it, when they're bleeding around five weeks, if they're seeing, you know, their six week follow-up is, is soon, then I'll say like, you know, call them, but you'll see them soon. Yeah. But it, at what point would you recommend that they reach back out to their provider, to their midwife? After six weeks, is that what you're? Well, I guess at any point, like if their bleeding isn't slowing down within the first couple of weeks, and I know with you all, they follow up at, is it two or three weeks? So yeah, we see uh, day two and three, depending on which one, um, and then two weeks and then six weeks. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, typically still light bleeding at two weeks, even spotting is normal. I would say that if we're still having almost like a regular flow type of bleeding at six weeks, that that's something I would be concerned about, okay. especially if there's anything else going on. If we have like maybe low milk supply, we start to have like your, uh, the uterus hasn't gone back to pre-pregnancy size, like other signs that shows that 
is there something going on within the uterus that we need to investigate? And we wouldn't investigate it. We would send them to get an ultrasound or to an OB to investigate and see, sure. make sure that there's like not a little part of the placenta still left behind or the membranes left behind. Typically that's gonna present sooner postpartum with like infection and increased bleeding. But you know, sometimes you could have that very late um, kind of onset of symptoms around six weeks. So if it's like suddenly different or a heavier flow, then that's when I would reach out, especially if like you've had like spotting and then all of a sudden a really heavy flow. And we get called all the time at two weeks because of that. Like right. maybe it stopped at two weeks and then like the next day it got heavy, but they came here to the birth center and then they went to like, maybe not so much nowadays with COVID-19, but in the past they would like go to Target and then like go to Radio Coffee and like do a bunch of stuff. And so sometimes that can cause an increase in bleeding, but if it feels out of the normal, just call. That is, that I'd makes sense. Room. Yeah. yeah, I'd rather hear from somebody than, than be like, oh, I didn't want to bother you, you know? Sure, sure, that's helpful. Um, we answered our next question, what are the main differences between OB and midwifery care? But our last question is, what's the difference between birthing centers connected to hospitals versus not connected? And what would make someone pick one versus the other? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, so like the ones I'm thinking about are like Dr. Sebastian's practice with natural beginnings. That's one that's kind of connected to the hospital. And so the biggest difference between I'm just going to use us as examples, the birth sure. center, ABC plus natural beginnings is that, um, it's owned by an OB and so, and it's all CNMs there. And so the biggest difference is that if in the event of a transport, the CNMs can go straight to North Austin medical center with the family and they can still provide care depending on the situation. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, because they have privileges at that hospital and it's kind of like built in. So um, it might be insurance reasons why people pick those hospitals because they might be covered more by insurance um, because of that. Um, it could be because of that safety net of being like right next to the hospital um, that people do that. So again, that compromise situation that I was talking about between the partners, um, that might be a good you know, uh, fit for them. Um, and so, and then there's also that, I feel like some practices will call their labor and delivery floor birth centers. And so I think you just really have to look at like, okay, where is the actual actual facility? Who owns it? Is it actually a part of the hospital? It's just like its own separate wing, you know, and they're calling that wing the birth center. Um, and does it have like the same policies and protocols as the hospitals essentially, or does it have its own set of rules? That, that makes sense. I wouldn't have thought that a labor and delivery unit could be labeled as a birthing center, but I can see how, I mean, even just the terminology, how that could happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. That is, that's really helpful. Thank you. Cool. Good. I don't no, those are all of our questions. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, they were. <laughs> we did it. Yeah, we did it. Those are all of our questions. So now, um, Michelle, if you still have a few minutes, we could open it up to Q and A's. It looks like we have one. If the laboring person is transported to the hospital, what does postpartum care look like for them? That's a good question. That's a really great question. So it really depends on what's going on. So if we're going in like that non-emergency, long labor type situation, um, especially if we go to the hospital group, their postpartum care typically is with us because the OB hospitalist group, they don't do postpartum care. And so typically what happens is they, you know, we're in touch with the family while they're at the hospital getting updates from them. In the past, we would go visit them, but now no longer, um, maybe again in the future, but we're, you know, trying to keep in touch with everybody. And typically the family will call us when they know that they're being discharged from the hospital and we set up to see them within 24 to 48 hours. Um, typically by that point, it's mainly just about lactation. Um, and making sure that we are on a good path for um, breastfeeding if the, if the family is choosing to breastfeed. Um, and because everything else has been done at the hospital, what we would have normally done at the two-day visit for baby has been done at the hospital. So like the congenital heart defect screening, the hearing screening, the little heel poke, newborn screening, all that's done already at the hospital. Um, if we um, transfer a pregnant person because let's say they developed preeclampsia at like 37 weeks, um, it really depends on what happens during the labor and what happens postpartum. And if they need medication to manage blood pressure postpartum, that's gonna be OB care that they will be to see with. Um, now, if everything's fine with the newborn, we can still provide the care for the newborn up to six weeks of age if, um, if we have a well baby. 
Um, but if anything's going on with baby and is already seen by the pediatrician, then, then they would just go into care with the OB and then the pediatrician, like they would if they were in OB care to begin with. That, that makes a lot of sense. That's really helpful. So there are kind of like a couple of different. Yeah. And it can kind of be tailored um, because like, for example, if they really want to come back to us, but they need medication for the OB, then maybe they can come back just for like a, a visit for baby. And then at six weeks, if they're not on medication anymore, then we can do that six week visit for mom. So it really just depends on like their risk status and, and how it changes postpartum. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we have another question from Sarah. When is the ideal time for someone to arrive in labor if they've been laboring at home? Do you care? That's a really good question. Do care? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does she know how you feel about this? I know. You're, she's, she's baiting me a little bit. Um, so when you're at a birth center, you know, you're, you have, we have these beautiful rooms, right? Most birth centers that I know, like all around the state, have just gorgeous facilities but you're just in the room, right? So when you're at home in early labor, you still have the comfort of your home. You can you know, walk outside to your patio or backyard. You can walk in your neighborhood. You can be in your own bed, you know, showering in your own shower where you have all your, your comfort and your amenities. Whereas here, you know, you're here, we're coming in you know, every 30 minutes, checking on you, checking on baby. And so we really, especially for first time families, actually this only applies to first time families, we really want you to spend most of that early labor at home because, you know, labor that first time can be like a, a train, right? And so it takes a lot of energy and maybe it's slow going at first, but when you get here, I really want that train to be in full seat mode and to be in active labor. So there's a couple of different parameters that we, that we talk with with our families prenatally. We talk about the 411, you might've heard of that. That's where contractions are typically four minutes apart. They're lasting a minute, or longer and it's been that way for an hour I always add the caveat no matter what position you're in they still are strong long and consistent um, and then also you're working through them because you can have those those timeline that you can have that parameter met in early labor some people's early labor start off where the contractions are three to four minutes apart but they're talking through them you know they're very like lucid during the contraction and maybe even in between the contractions they're like yeah talking like this Whereas with active labor, typically, you know, we're having to hold on to something, we're breathing, we're rocking, we're moaning. And even after the contraction's over, maybe it takes us a little bit to kind of come back into ourselves to respond to anybody that's, uh, that's asking us questions or talking to us. And so those are good parameters to meet, to match with that 411 as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we always want people to call like if their water breaks, because when, you know, when asked questions about that and if they're GBS positive, but typically we want that active labor pattern. So for like um, a first time laboring person, if they come in and they're five to six centimeters, that's awesome. You know, if they come in and they're two to three, we're probably gonna hang out for a little bit to see, are we having just a fast labor and these big contractions? Are, are we dehydrated and we need to talk about that? Or mm -hmm. do we need to get rest and how can we talk about that? Oh, and then for, oh, go ahead. Ahead. I was going to say for, for uh, families that have delivered before, especially vaginally, then those parameters change and they really change based on their prior experience with labor and birth. So if they have a history of a fast birth, then we might have them call us, you know, when contractions start kind of thing. Okay. That was going to be my follow up question. Okay. You yeah. find that was for first time. So what happens if it's, if it's not their first, so that's just based on their prior birth experience. Yes. Kind of the, the general thing is we talk about, um, instead of four, one, one, it's five to seven, one, one. So when contractions are on average between five to seven minutes apart, maybe they're lasting a minute and it's been like that for an hour and you've tried different positions and they're still pretty consistent. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's really helpful. I'm trying, I'm checking to see if we have any other questions. Does anybody, else have other questions those were both great and i know that we answered a lot of the ones that you entered when you registered we'll give people a minute but thank you so much michelle that was so enlightening and really amazing the information was incredible i learned a lot so thank you yeah definitely i appreciate you having me on i was glad to show off my shirt i know i couldn't wash mine in time but I'm oh, no. <laughs> we could be twinsies yeah but i wanted to give a shout out to scout wild awake i love her she's on I think that's her Instagram handle, right? It's at Scout, Scout Wild, Wild Awake. I think I yeah. think so. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll put it in the notes. I can. Yeah, I can put links below, yeah. and I can I can put her website um, yeah. below. But yeah, she's fantastic. She's really good. Yeah, I love all of her posts. She she does good work. Yeah, she does. She really does. Um, 
Uh, we got, do we have any more? No, we didn't. So I guess, I guess those are all of our questions. Thank you all for joining. I'm glad yeah, that you no. spent your one hour of your evening with us. Yeah, um, if you have any other questions, you can reach out to me and I can, Michelle, if you're okay with that, I can forward them to you. Sure. Yeah. Um, this recording, we will post it and I will distribute it to all of the attendees in case you wanted to rewatch a certain part. But thank you so much, Michelle, for all of the really amazing right. information and for your time. And I'm really grateful to have you in our community. Yeah. I'm grateful to have good PTs like you. I think that physical therapy should just be like standard. After the six week visit, the person should just go right next door to be evaluated by a pelvic floor PT. Just, we all need to follow France one day. and lead on that. Yeah. Exactly. France, I think, yeah. has 10, they have 10 sessions of pelvic floor physical therapy given to all postpartum people. That's great. That's amazing. It's great. Yeah. So keep up the good work. You know what you're doing. Someday. Um, so thank you so much, Michelle. Have a fantastic evening. Thank you. You too. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody.